Mr. Stan Tarasosa. The stage is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Stan, as I, uh, Steve may have mentioned, I'm going to be reading the questions to you. However, you have about uh, five minutes to give an opening statement. When you're finished, I'll go ahead and start the questions. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here and to share a little bit with you and to continue the conversation that I started with um, the interview selection panel earlier in this process. I appreciate that very much. I think by way of just an intro introductory statement and an opportunity to talk with you, I want to um, share with you a couple of things. I want to talk to you a little bit about my development in my career and the experiences that I have and about my interest in being part of a leadership team for College of the Sequoias. I guess the elephant in the room with me as the candidate is that I don't come to you with a community college background and experience, but I do want to talk to you about the experiences that I do have, and I hope you'll be open to understanding how those experiences can translate into successful and positive leadership at the community college level. Uh, obviously, I started out as a teacher and an instructor, science teacher by trade. Had the opportunity to um, work at administrative level in the K-12 system, really at every chair. So I've been a, a high school assistant principal, a high school principal. I've been an assistant superintendent, and then I've been superintendent of a smaller school district, Dynamic Unified School District, and then a larger school district, Visalia Unified School District. And I'm currently serving as superintendent for Burbank Unified School District. Each time in my career, as I've worked hard and tried to uh, advance, it's always been motivated by um, an opportunity for a greater sphere of influence, the opportunity to um, make changes, develop systems, provide opportunities for people that could wrap around providing great services for the organization and for kids. So as a classroom teacher, I knew I, I impacted my 160 or 180 kids on my caseload. As an assistant principal, I was able to expand that a little bit further. As a principal, I could touch the thousands of kids that were in high school. And as an assistant superintendent and superintendent, you can actually touch the thousands and thousands of students and people in the entire school community. So that's kind of been my motivation. I think because I've had the experience of being here in the Valley, I'm a native Van Newman, and an opportunity to know the Valley very well, that's something that I hope is of interest and um, significance to to this process. I think the Valley is a pretty unique place and one that we um, all love, especially those of us who have made our lives and our careers here. And so in the back of your mind, you're probably saying, well, if you love the Valley so much, why did you leave? And so I think it's fair for me to share with you a little bit of what that decision-making process was like. Uh, after 10 years with Visalia Unified School District, I had assembled what I thought was probably one of the best school district teams in the state there. Wasn't looking for the opportunity to go, but got a call got a request to consider a different experience. Thought about that a little bit. At that time in my career, I looked at where my children were, the daughter and son, both in college, both in the Los Angeles area, both working in the performing arts, both wanting to excel in the performing arts and looking like they were probably going to plant roots in Southern California. So with this opportunity to be part of a different kind of district, an urban district, and a more corporate environment, and a more entertainment-based sector, I thought it might be a very interesting opportunity for us, for my wife and I, and a chance to be a little bit closer to our kids while they were still in their early 20s and wanted to hang out with mom and dad for a little bit. And so that's the decision that we made. I had probably hoped and thought long and hard about staying in that assignment and maybe even retiring there but always upon retirement, wanting to come back to the Valley. This is where our family is. I married my high school sweetheart from Dinuba. She's one of nine children. I have 67 nieces and nephews, of which I cooked for yesterday at Mother's Day. And so we knew that our retirement would be back here. So this opportunity, I couldn't control the timing of. It's the kind of opportunity that I thought uh, I would always be interested in, a chance to serve at the community college level a chance to build connections between the K-12 and the community college system and then learn what we need to learn in order to do that effectively as we transition our kids into the workforce and into the university system. The, um, the experiences I've had in leadership include boardsmanship and working with boards of directors, great boards of directors, many elections, many transitions, many opportunities to work with experienced board members, many opportunities to help build capacity with board members. 
I've worked extensively with budget and budget development at the organizational level. Dynamic Unified was about a $35 million budget. Visalia Unified was a $225 million budget. Burbank Unified is about a $125 million budget. So I know that the nomenclature is different. I know that the guidelines are a little different. Some of the um, formulas are a little different. But I've proven myself as a person who can be pretty fiscally strong and conservative, but participatory in how we make those budget decisions. And then finally, I think in the role as superintendent, I've worked with planning for and implementing collective bargaining agreements, working with employee associations, working on staff development, collaboration, shared governance, and actually putting structures in place in, in the K-12 system that look a lot like what we do very effectively in the community college system in terms of participatory management and shared decision making. So while my experiences might not line up perfectly at the community college level, I think there's a lot there that I hope to share with you about what, what I've done and how it can become applicable um, as a leader at the community college level. Thank you. It is no secret California is in dire straits. It is also no secret that the community colleges in California have far more and much different challenges than the K-12 and university systems. Please identify five or more primary differences, challenges, and explain how your educational and work experience has prepared you to take on the challenges that are unique to a California community college. Okay, <clears throat> yeah, I got a chance to look at this one. This is one of those 11 questions all in one. <laughs> I did write them. I'm all it's done. okay if I get a little bit more. Everybody's seen the suit already, right? <laughs> All right, they would like to get a little more comfortable uh, under the lights. Um, you know, I think the key, as I think about the key differences, for me, um, I shared a little bit of this a moment ago, the organizational structure is different. It's different than K-12, and it's actually different than the um, university system. I think the board governance structure is different. Um, I think we deal with the shorter time frame, the two-year span. You know, ideally, the design for the two-year span is unique to the community college level setting. We serve a little bit as a connector. We have a, a role and a purpose primarily. I think we were founded right on the opportunity to be able to build academic transitions and successful progression to the university and workforce development, certifications, preparation, etc. cetera. Um, funding is different. The funding model is a little bit different, different than the continuum on either side of us. And then um, the actual Kind of structure for decision making and the shared governance model. So when I think about those areas and then I think about the experiences that I have and being able to help serve, um, here's some of the things again that I want to share with you in a little bit more detail. As the uh, superintendent of the Dinuba Unified School District, when I got there, it wasn't a unified school district. It was actually two school districts. It was a little bit like what we know in the Valley, a Woodlake, uh, an Exeter, previously Porterville, Dinuba, we had an elementary district and we had a high school district. And they were separate independent entities. Their own finance systems, their own structures, their own bylaws, their own organizations, governed by a common administration. So I learned a lot about boardsmanship. I learned a lot about how to work with boards, how to work with an elementary board, a high school board, and then collectively a, a joint board. So for me, it was an opportunity to um, develop those skills in terms of how board members come into the process, the role that they play, the governance structures that they provide us, and the decision making that they make, that then we get the opportunity to try to transition and to implement. So I, I use that as one example of how, because the board structure at the community college level is a little different than both of those, I'm hoping that you're going to be interested in a candidate who has some wordsmanship experience and some wordsmanship abilities. Those are the kinds of things you get when you're a sitting superintendent. Um, again, budget development and um, the challenge of the budget at the community college level, I think right now, we're probably in the most difficult times that we've been in for a long time. And I know that the structure and the formula for the community college system has some unique features to it. We've got our FTES base for our funding, that's kind of the equivalent in the K-12 system of our base revenue limit. We have a responsibility to maintain 50% of our budget in the academic program. That's a guideline we don't get to fudge with. We have a full-time obligation number that we're required to meet, so that controls a little bit how we allocate those resources. We've got cash flow issues, 
just like we do in the other sectors right now. But one of the things that we're looking at is we're looking at how to be able to really make cash throughout the course of the year. Because what the state's doing for all of us, and community colleges included, is they're deferring our allocations for revenue. So we may be getting money, but getting it later than we were, than we were supposed to. And so in the meantime, if we don't have reserves internally to draw from, if we don't have the opportunity to borrow money to bridge that, then um, we're going to be in a difficult situation. So knowing what I know about the system I work in, I think there's some real um, strengths that I can bring and some creativity that I can bring to uh, managing the budget as effectively as, as possible under difficult conditions. When I went to that new Unified, it was in a, a difficult condition, and we were able to help correct that course and, and build a positive outcome for there. When I arrived at Visalia Unified School District, it was in a difficult condition. It was the late 1990s. We had just passed Measure G. The bond money was rolling in, but it didn't have um, the right structure in place to implement it effectively. There was a loss of confidence in the part of the community. There had been two superintendents in three years, and both slates of board members had been moved out of the, of the process through the subsequent two elections. And so it was very, very unstable. And it was an opportunity to take um, all that we know about the literature on organizational theory, all that we know about the research on behavior and change, and start to experiment with that in positive ways and put structures in place to help it be successful. So again, those kinds of experiences, I think, um, have positioned me to be able to do very well in the setting. I don't hear the kinds of trauma in the community college setting that, that I just described to you in those two districts, but I know that there are really difficult times. And COS, while it has a long-standing, fabulous reputation, it has a, a challenges right now as well, some of them that we've just mentioned. So I have the kinds of experiences very comparable to the challenges that we face and would love the opportunity to serve and try to um, put some positive solutions in place. Thank you. Given the backdrop of severe budget reductions, diverse student body, low student retention rates, demand for courses, and a high proportion of students who come to us underprepared for college, if you were selected as the next president of COS, how would you propose the college respond to the demands placed upon it? Well, there, that's one of those questions, John, where there's like a lot of stuff back there. So, um, you know, I guess if, if I had to think about those in some sort of priority order, you rattled off the budget reductions, the diverse student body, low retention rates, demand for courses, high proportion of students who come to us unprepared. That, that talks to the systemic complexity of the community college system. And again, what I, what I go to is I go to the experience that I have in taking a look at all of that and being able to pull it apart a little bit, analyze how it works together, start to put it back together in a sequential fashion that hopefully um, maximizes the ability for it to interact and become something positive and effective at the end. That sounded pretty hypothetical and maybe even a little academic, so let me give you a couple of practical um, examples. I would start with the budget. I'd start with the concern we have right now. I think until we get the money in order, everybody's got anxiety. And unfortunately, we don't like to say this, but the budget drives so many things. And so whatever the landscape is right now in the college community about the budget and the finance, I think we need to take a look at that. I think we need to understand what the budget realities are. If there's a lack of trust in the information, we need to build that trust. If there's a lack of transparency in the figures and the dollars and the money that's out there, we need to be transparent. We need to show that information. If there's some education that needs to happen among the college community or the community at large, we need to take an active role in helping that education to take place. But our story needs to be clear. It needs to be honest and it needs to be factual. And then I think um, we can start to figure out, once, we, once we've all decided we can agree on what the key issues are and the key challenges are, we can start to figure out some solutions. But until we get the budget ideas solved, we're going to have that underlying anxiety that's going to make it really difficult. Either purposefully or unintentionally, it's going to make it really difficult to get to the other issues. I think the other issues are incredibly important, though, and I guess I'm the kind of leader that you should know that while I'm willing to work on the budget and work on the collective bargaining and negotiable aspects of it, we can't stop the whole organization while that's going on. 
So we do need to stay focused on the primary mission. We do need to take a look at the issues that are driving the lower retention rates. We do need to take a look at the issues of diversity of our students and, and continue to work on them. We've got systems in place to do that. I'd love the opportunity to analyze those. I'd be the first one to tell you that I couldn't come in and turn that all upside down. I think I'd come in first and learn it, study it, see what we do, and then try to bring my experiences to bear to improve that and to make it better. So there's a lot of moving parts. They all require some work simultaneously. That's what I've spent the last 19 years doing as a superintendent in multifaceted um, district structures is juggling all of that information and all of those moving parts simultaneously, continually realigning them in ways that they can be stronger, better, and more effective. Maximizing resources, achieving the goals of the achievement for the organization's primary purpose, and building good relationships, positive relationships. You don't go to a leadership position in a district, like by Cell Unified School District, and stay there for 10 years and three budget cycles and several rounds of negotiations and going to impasse, and going to mediation, and going to fact finding and make it through that and stay and find a successful solution and then afterwards have a good, positive outcome and build new structure. You don't do all that without having some ability to be able to bring people together and work through those processes. So again, for me, it's about relationships, um, honesty, respect. There's a set of core values that you'll always be able to count on from me in managing these complex issues. The technical stuff, we have a ton of really bright people around us, and I think we would want to use all of them. But what you need to count on from the person who's your president, your superintendent, is that they're going to be honest, and there's going to be a set of core values that are going to drive their work, and that's going to be consistent. It's going to be fair. It's going to be open. And um, we don't always agree. We can agree to disagree. Um, but we're never going to be mean, and we're never going to mistreat or hurt each other. And that's a little bit how I like to operate. When I see a multifaceted question like this that has so much to it, I kind of start to step back and say it's really about the processes we put in place to try to work together. Thank you. We have about 13 minutes left. Question number three. Explain your understanding of the recently adopted Student Success Task Force recommendations. Describe how you would implement these recommendations here at COS in order to improve student success and describe the opportunities and challenges this will present. I've spent some time with the Student, um, student Success Task Force report and recommendations. It's, it's um, one of the things I guess that I would ask you to think about is having been a leader in the K-12 system for the last two decades, we've had a number of mandated legislative reforms. We've lived and are living with the Public School Accountability Act of 1998, the No Child Left Behind Act of 2002, the Race to the Top of 2008. So we've had the state and federal mandated legislative change. We've had to kind of dig in and reinvent ourselves. One of the things I've learned in that process is that it isn't all great just because someone else studied it and told us this is the stuff you should do. But there are some things in there. I think we should have an open mind to what's in there. I think we should look at what we're currently doing and try to match up with those pieces of that task force report that could be effective and successful and help us. There's eight recommendations in there. You all probably know them better than I do, but it would be increasing the career college readiness, strengthening support for our entering students, incentivize successful, successful student behaviors, align the course offerings to meet student needs, improve education and basic skills, revitalize and re-envision staff development, enable efficiency statewide with leadership to increase the coordination among the colleges, and then in the end, align the resources. So some of it's going to take place at a legislative le level, which would allow me to use all the contacts and connections I have established at both county, state, and national level. Some of it's going to happen here with us. Some of it's going to be um, through the shared governance model, reinvented a little bit, and, and reconnected in ways that could be positive for College of the Sequoias. The other thing we have working for us is we do have the five-year strategic plan that this college has already done. There's a number of things that COS really does very well already align with this task force. So there's, there's a bunch of work that's been laid in, in place for us to be, um, to be successful. My approach would be think big, but start small. Look at the things that we know we need to do. Try to make them work effectively. Measure them a little bit at a time. Make changes as they're appropriate and make changes as they bring the results that we want. 
Don't rush in. Don't try to turn everything upside down. Don't take a report, implement it wholesale. Um, we're, we're a moving, living, breathing organization. Probably wouldn't be a successful strategy to try to do that. Thank you. Last question. Give us two more examples of your use of innovative, innovative budgeting in good times and in bad, and tell us both the effects on the college and the general financial strategies or approaches to be drawn from your experiences. Um, yeah, as you gave me this question and I looked at the word innovative, I thought anything right now that makes the budget work and balance is innovative. <laughs> because the budget struggle we really are in is pretty much a survival mode. So we're kind of creating, I, I use the metaphor of we're fixing the airport as it's leaving the runway. The airplane as it's leaving the runway. We're down there with our tools, but this thing's already in motion and we have to make some adjustments on the fly and make it work. Um, as I think of, of a district experience I had that was a, one where we had to struggle and we were in what we've defined here as bad times. I think about the financial state of Dinuba Unified School District when I arrived there. I told you it was two separate districts. The budget in the high school district was bankrupt. The budget in the elementary district was flush. They were separate. They didn't want to share the money. So the boardsmanship that came into place with me there was to talk about how we could combine those two districts. It actually was a fairly complicated process. We had to go through a piece of legislation. We had to hold a community election. And we had to agree to unify those two school districts, which meant two school boards of five members each had to agree to half of them giving up their seats and consolidating into one board of five in an election and eliminating their, their territory and becoming one large district. What it did for us financially, though, is it gave us that average base revenue limit. Instead of getting some money per student for high school and some money per student for elementary, we got a combined amount per student for the total unified population. It increased by the Unified School District's base revenue limit, our general fund, by 10.5%, just simply by taking a blended revenue limit and multiplying it times the same number of kids. So we involved everybody. We went to our employee associations. They had a stake in it. They said, hey, our salaries aren't good. They're not comparable. Our benefits and our salaries need to be fixed. If you want our support in this, we want to know that some of this money will help us. So we dedicated a third of the new money to correcting the inequities in the salary schedule. The board wanted to build a new elementary school, but we couldn't pass a bond. So we dedicated a third of the new money to actually being our local match to fund a new elementary school. And then the third part, the third third of that money, we just said we need to have money on hand every year. We need things. We're a small, we were an older, tired district. We needed technology and equipment. So we set up one third of the fund for capital outlay and divided it up through a process so that everybody got to get some new things and upgrade. It was a wonderful way that we used an innovative solution to bring new money into the district that hadn't been able to be done, be done before. The second example, real quick, in good times, I guess, is when we were in the housing boom here in Visalia back in 2004, 5, 6, 7, and um, Visalia Unified School District was getting a chunk of developer fees rolling in every year because we got a per square foot fee on all of the schools, uh, on, on all of the host, town, host little homes that were built in the school area. We were building up a pretty good developer fee budget. We had finished the Measure G bond. We had a lot of money here locally from the developer fees. We decided to start to parcel it out and buy property for future school sites and use it as our local match to build new elementary schools. Elementary schools are the most cost effective. They're smaller. They don't have gyms and science labs and swimming pools and stadiums. So we could tell the community that we took the developer fees and we built your neighborhood schools. We used that as our state match. And we didn't have to pass a bond. In the 10 years that I was here, we built six new elementary schools in seven years. And we had one on the books when I left, and it's Shannon Ranch, and it's being built now. And we did all that without having to pass a bond because we had the foresight to buy the property, use the developer fees appropriately. And what that was doing to make all this construction happen is it was allowing us to take those cost of living adjustments that were coming into the budget when we were getting COLAs and apply those to the salary schedule and to the operational programs of the district. So we were taking care of everybody in an appropriate way. Open, honest, transparent. Um, a really good example, I think, of, of taking good care of the community's money and doing it effectively. And now we're, now we're actually enjoying the benefits of that. We've got all the, all the elementary schools up here around calendars. Everybody's on the traditional calendar. There's room for all the kids in the district. And uh, I feel really fortunate to have been a part of that.
Thank you. You have about five minutes to give a closing statement. Okay. Well, as I said earlier, I think um, we've talked a little bit about the elephant in the room, but I hope I've had the opportunity to share a little bit with you the experiences that I can bring from the work that I've done and the education that I have and the time that I've spent in the Valley um, to be considered a, a really potentially successful leader for, uh, for College of Sequoias. Um, I'm a Valley person. I'm not going to hide that. I think uh, that's one of the things that I hope is attractive to, to you about me, is I think when the new president, superintendent comes in, whoever it is, we're all going to have a learning curve. And some of the things that a new president is going to have to learn about College of Sequoias is probably, you know, what's the Central Valley like? What are the cultures and traditions that um, are inherent here? What's our economic and educational development levels, the demographics of our area? It's a part of the learning curve. Um, what are our neighboring communities like? What's the district like? What's the university like? I think we're also going to have to um, know a little bit about boardsmanship and governance, because I know I could be a president of a sitting campus right now, or I could be a vice president on a campus right now. I could even be a uh, vice chancellor in a central office right now. But if I haven't been superintendent, then I haven't been in the position to plan the budget, implement the budget, to plan and implement collective bargaining agreements, and to work with and govern the collective <coughs> board of, of education and the, and the board of officials. So everybody's gonna have a learning curve. They're gonna have some things they need to learn. We also need to know the academic program. We need to know student services. We need to know the student success task force. We need to know the inner workings of the campuses. We need to know the community college system. So I see myself with those are the four or five biggies as having that, that superintendent kind of experience that I think is really important. A track record of success in working with boards, building and managing budgets, taking care of facilities. Um, a track record of planning and implementing collective bargaining agreements, contract negotiations. Uh, those are the things that, unless you've been in the superintendent position, um, you're, you're not going to know whether you can do those uh, effectively or successfully. And so for me, the learning curve is going to be to get with the team on the campus and to start to understand the procedural workings and the culture of, of the campus of the college schools. And I feel like that's probably the safest place to be on the learning curve because you're surrounded by talented people in a shared governance model in which you're supposed to be relying upon their expertise anyway. So I see that as an opportunity for me to be able to facilitate and use my leadership skills as I have in the past. And I would love the opportunity to do that and to try to help us be successful. The other real quick, the other nuances about the Valley, um, you know, I'm, I know that it's 105 degrees here in the summer. I know that we have Thule fog in the winter. Personally, growing up here, those are two of my favorite things because it keeps half of Los Angeles and LA from wanting to move here. <laughs> so I like that. I love the smell of the dairies. I was assistant principal at Hanford High School, so I know Kings County and I know Hanford, and that's one of our, our uh, campus communities. Um, love the community. Had a home there. Uh, my son was born there. And then I was principal at Corcoran High School. And that's one of our schools and one of our communities. And had a wonderful opportunity to live in Corcoran, had a home there, raised my children there before we took the superintendency in Van Uyden. So I have the privilege of knowing people like J.G. Boswell and Donnie Gilkey and, and the Salyers. And, and so there's some things about the familiarity with the area that I think are pretty, um, pretty important and pretty intangible, and I hope they're very valuable to you. So I would make a commitment to you if you give me the opportunity to be here and to serve as your superintendent president, to bring everything that I know about the Valley to bear in the successes and to work with you as a team of academic and collegiate professionals to make sure that College of the Sequoias makes it through the difficult cycle we're in right now, and not only survives that, but thrives in ways that can be creative and can be powerful for the important role that this institution plays in the economic and academic development of the central part of the valley. 
So with that, I thank you for the opportunity to be before you today. I apologize in advance for being nervous. Um, when we were walking in, they said, uh, the ladies in the office were laughing, going, yeah, they're taking that first lamb to slaughter. <laughs> and then they walked me by the green room, and I realized this is a little bit like the green mile coming down the corridor. <laughs> but actually, you've been a pretty nice audience, very quiet, very attentive. So um, I won't leave anything um, uh, for the next person to be nervous about. I think it's all going very well. Would love the opportunity to serve and be a part of College of Displays, and thank you for the chance to be here and share my thoughts and ideas with you today.